On this Ash Wednesday, Pope Francis opens his first full Lenten season as the Holy Father. We'll take you to Rome tonight. Did you ever wonder where your ashes comes from? We'll show you. We'll talk about the canonization of the good Pope with an Archbishop who served as a young priest with John the 23rd. And it could be a big step towards finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Medical students are getting insight directly from patients. Those stories and more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, March 5th, 2014. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick in for Colleen. We begin tonight looking at News Now. Pope Francis is observing this Ash Wednesday in Rome. Today, of course, marks the beginning of Lent, a 40-day period of penance and purification leading up to Holy Week and Easter. The Pope started out at St. Anselmo for a moment of prayer. From there, he processed with cardinals, archbishops, and Dominican fathers, and some faithful to Santa Sabina. There, the Holy Father celebrated Mass. Glory. Ancora. In his homily, Pope Francis said, we live in a culture of doing, but Lent calls us to give ourselves a shake-up. He said, we should remember we are creatures, we're not God. Pope Francis also highlighted three elements of Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. He received ashes himself, then put ashes on cardinals and other clergy. Here are some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Not just in Rome, but all over the world, a billion Catholics are marking the start of Lent. Filipino Catholics lined up outside a church in the capital of Manila. Their foreheads are marked with ashes in the form of a cross. For Catholics and many other Christians, the ashes are a reminder of death and a sign of penitence. Iran is working to finalize a deal with the U.S. and five other global powers to scale back its nuclear program. It would be in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. But speaking to journalists today in Tokyo, Iran's foreign minister pushed back against calls for deeper cuts to the program. Iran has the technology, the know-how, the scientists, workshops that produce centrifuges. So you cannot simply have the illusion that Iran, because of pressure or coercion, will simply give up. The Iran foreign minister met with his Japanese counterpart today. He said Iran is eager to tap Japan's nuclear power capability. Well, it was one year since former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez died, but in some areas it looks like he's still around. His portrait is still on buildings, memorabilia, and daily on television. His supporters paid their respects today at the Hugo Chavez Chapel in Caracas. His death was commemorated for 10 days with events including the debut of Oliver Stone's documentary, My Friend Hugo. But critics of Chavez and his policies said they oppose the festivities, especially in light of Venezuela's national crisis. Since its closing in 1971, the bookshelves of this Orthodox seminary have been gathering dust. Its classrooms sit empty. It's a big problem for the Orthodox Church, known as the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Halki is the only Orthodox seminary in Turkey, and the next patriarch must be a Turkish citizen educated there. The archbishop in charge of the seminary says he is ready to start classes any time, but it's not likely that the government will allow that. The current patriarch, Bartholomew, met last year with Pope Francis, a historic first since the split between East and West. International Women's Day has been observed around the world since the 1900s. It comes around again this Saturday. The Vatican will celebrate by inviting women from six countries to talk about how the Catholic faith has influenced their life and work. To talk about the role of women in the church and in the world, we have Mary Rice Hassan of the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in D.C., also Jeannie Monahan, president of the March for Life Fund, and a longtime advocate for marriage and family. It's so good to have both of you Thank here. You. It's a delight to be here. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Mary, here in 2014, what progress do you think we can celebrate in terms of women's equality? I think there's many, many things. Certainly the education of women across the globe. We can see that women routinely now are achieving very high uh, levels of education. In fact, at least in the United States, there are more women in graduate school programs in the professions then there are men. Um, so education is certainly one, but also women's accomplishments in the professional world. You see women achieving 
anything they set out to do. And, and that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, my youngest daughter was in, in a class uh, in dental school, and it was the first class at the University of Louisville where there were more women mm -hmm. than there were men in dental school. What do you think of the gains we can celebrate? Gosh, so much. I, I was thinking of the same ones Mary mentioned, but we've also just learned so much more just about women and what it means to be a woman, even if you think about her body and what we know about natural family planning and all sorts of things. I mean, we've, we've actually just learned a lot research-wise and scientifically to understand a woman's brain and how it's different than a man's brain. I mean, we just have a lot more information about what it means to be a woman as well. Thank God that we're not all men. <laughs> I could just say that. So, it's a nice compliment, the two. <laughs> what challenges lie ahead then? Oh my goodness. I, I, I'm a little discouraged with some of the challenges, especially in the United States. Um, this whole false messaging in terms of the war on women is something that I've been sort of living and breathing and sleeping lately, and I think we have to take it back. I mean, the understanding of what it means to be a woman and the dignity and vocation of a woman is profound, and not only that, it's necessary. It's necessary for a healthy and happy culture. And so I think our largest challenge right now is overcoming a misunderstanding of what it means to be a woman. I would absolutely agree with that. It's, and I think women themselves have lost that sense of who they are. And so we shouldn't be measuring ourselves by our utility how useful we are, Amen. which with all the gains in, in employment achievement, you know, women are accomplishing so many things, but that's not really where our value lies. And abortion is often touted as a right for women, mm -hmm. and it's connected with this equality issue. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, here's the thing with that. You know, I, I agree with you. The whole messaging has just gotten uh, confused. But the main thing is the feminist left, really, advocates the idea that equality for women means you have to have access to contraception, to abortion, as if alienating your womanhood is the way to really make gains in the world. And I think that's such a lie I for completely women. agree, and there are so many different ways we could talk about this, but one of the things that strikes me is that this idea of abortion being a good thing for women, first mm -hmm. of all, that's, it's mm -hmm. so wrong. So many women profoundly regret their abortions. It hurts them physiologically, right. psychologically, but there's this weird understanding that women and men or this weird sort of idea that's been forwarded that women and men are intrinsically the same, mm -hmm. which is a mm -hmm. lie. Thank there's God they're some, not. <laughs> there's something about our capacity mm -hmm. to be mothers that does mm -hmm. make us different. Gloria Steinem made this terrible comment over the last week about how if we didn't have our wombs, we'd be doing just fine. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, oh, we're defined by our wombs. Well, no, mm -hmm. we're not defined by the capacity right. to be a mother, but the capacity to be a mom does have a lot to do about where we find our dignity and vocation. Regardless of whether you are a mom or not, there is something that's a little more person-centric. Well, so. it reminds you continually that you have room for another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're called to do. Our hearts are to be for others. Thank God. And we're not meant to be interchangeable. And Beautiful discussion, yeah. Mary. Yeah. Jeannie, we thank, thank you. you for being Thanks with for us tonight. Us. All right, now more than ever, of course, abortion is at the center of debate in Texas. We have more on that story from EWTN News Nightly, Susie Pinto. The race for Texas governor is on. Republicans nominated Attorney General Greg Abbott. Meanwhile, Democrats nominated State Senator Wendy Davis. Davis became a national name last summer with her 13-hour filibuster against new Texas abortion restrictions. Abortion is an issue she continues to use for her campaign. Greg Abbott, he wants to dictate for all women, including victims of rape or incest, the decisions that they should make. I will be a governor who fights for the future of Texas. But how do Texans feel about the issue? According to a 2013 University of Texas, also, Texas Tribune so poll, nearly 40 percent of Texans think there needs well, to be stricter to laws restricting abortion. The executive director of the Texas Alliance for Life, Dr. Joe Poyman, told EWTN News Nightly, Wendy Davis is the most pro-abortion candidate for governor Texas has had in over 20 years. He also said her campaign as part of an effort to erase the substantial gains the state has made in the pro-life cause. Dr. Poyman said Texas voters should know Greg Abbott is pro-life. Whoever is elected governor in November will succeed Rick Perry, who has been the Texas governor for 14 years. Susie Pinto reporting. Top U.S. leaders met today to talk about the response to Russia's takeover of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. They're stepping up U.S. support of European allies. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel said supporting Ukraine's elections in two months 
is a top priority for the U.S. right now. Also today, Republicans and Democrats on the Foreign Affairs Committee introduced a resolution condemning Russia's actions in Ukraine. I spoke this morning with my Russian counterpart, General Valery Gerasimov. I conveyed to him the degree to which Russia's territorial aggression has been reputed globally. The committee's resolution proposing more sanctions will be addressed tomorrow. Well, back to Ash Wednesday now. We've been talking a lot about ashes. You've probably seen them all over town, wherever you live. But have you ever wondered where those ashes come from? Jason Calvi gives us the dirt on Ash Wednesday. <laughs> This pile of ash has a somber future and a triumphant past. The story for this year's ashes begins Palm Sunday one year ago in Rome, D.C., and worldwide. But the palms themselves honor Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago. During this past year, we've kept those blessed palms in our homes as a reminder of Christ's victory. But this week... Be merciful, O Lord. For we have sinned. Against you only have I sinned. Last year's palms go up in smoke here at St. Thomas Apostle Church in Washington. Monsignor Andrew Wadsworth and Father Richard Mullins are the founding members of a startup oratory and religious community here in Washington. We're offering to God something which has already been a sign of his grace and favor to us. And in its changed meaning, we ourselves hope to be changed by the penance, by the prayer. The National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception staff also make their own ashes. But not every parish burns their own palms for ashes. Here at Peter Moonley Church Goods in Virginia, you can buy things like the chasuble used by the priest during Mass. You can buy statues and you can buy ashes. This store serves parishes from Maryland down to South Carolina. The owner estimates about 70% of the parishes in the Arlington Diocese purchase ashes from stores like his. But no matter if they're bought or burned, ashes mark foreheads today. In the Old Testament, ashes are a sign both of mourning and of penance. So we are sad for our sins and we seek God's forgiveness. And the ashes remind the faithful, you are dust and to dust you will return. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up, the Vatican has released a video of Pope Francis' first year in the chair of St. Peter. We'll show you part of it. Then later, the only living English-speaking priest who worked directly with Pope John XXIII joins us from Hartford. On this Ash Wednesday edition of EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick, joined by Alan Holdren, who is on the ground in Rome. Alan, even as the Pope is saying that he doesn't want to be referred to as a super Pope, I understand the Italian media is using the word super to describe some of his reforms. That's right. Uh, the, uh, there's talk around Rome right now about the next innovation in uh, Pope Francis' reforms. These are super ministries. Just like last week, there was an oversight organization department created to uh, oversee the financial aspect of the Vatican. It's called the Secretariat for the Economy. There could be coming up uh, a new Secretariat for Communications, and another one for the pastoral care of the laity. Now, these super ministries, as they're called, uh, could be led by friends of the Pope. Now, I say this because uh, the last three important appointments made by the Pope were personal friends of his that were tapped to oversee different parts of this uh, Secretariat for the Economy and other financial aspects of the Holy See. Uh, now, these men were from other places than Italy. This shows that the Pope is looking to distance himself from the Italian bureaucracy, which has really kind of, uh, made the Vatican a slower organism, perhaps. And uh, Vatican officials have told me that looking elsewhere will, will tend to clean this up. And he's done that in the appointment of an Australian, of a Spaniard, and a Maltese in recent days. The Pope also apparently trying to distance himself from this idea of a super Pope. In fact, he mentioned that in an interview. Tell us more about that interview. He's very personal. Yeah, this interview came out today. It was published in the Corriere della Sera, which is an Italian newspaper. And uh, we see a real human side to the Pope. He talks about being a person who laughs, who cries. Uh, who sleeps tranquilly and who has friends. He said he's a normal person. And this really comes through. We see his pastoral approach. Um, also his uh, relationship with Benedict XVI, who now lives there in the Vatican with him. Uh, he says about Benedict that he's not just a statue in a museum and that he seeks him for counsel. He also talks about other things like uh, how he calls a widow 
every month just wants to check in on her and see how she's doing. And, uh, and also here in the Vatican in, in these days, people are remembering that this is the one year anniversary since his election. We caught up to the, uh, the director of the Centro, uh, the Vatican's television center to hear a little bit more about this. It is a story of the gestures and the words of the magisterium of Pope Francis over the course of this year, which in some way also offers a view of the witness and legacy of Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict, who bids farewell to his pontificate, saying that it is important to convert our hearts, not scandalizing ourselves by the sins that we think others always commit, but making our hearts docile and open to the action of the Holy Spirit. Pope Francis picks up this testimony and helps us precisely in this way, on a path of discernment, a path on which he asks us to open our hearts so that the gospel of God can live in us. Well, Brian, so this video really shows uh, what the events of last year were like from the transition from one pope to the other and also the important events in that human side of Pope Francis ever since. What a beautiful look at an incredible year for our church and the world. Thank you, Alan Holdren, joining us from Rome tonight. And now for the next in our series, Saints for Today. It's an honor and a blessing to be joined by Archbishop Emeritus Daniel Cronin of Hartford, Connecticut, who's joining us by satellite from Hartford. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to be with you, Brian. You were one of the few English-speaking priests who worked alongside Blessed John the 23rd. You were a very young man at the time, in your mid-30s. What was that experience like for you? Well, it was, uh, it was a tremendous honor to be with him at any, on any occasion. Of course, my uh, association with him was quite limited because I was the junior man. There were actually four priests in the section, the English language section, that had seniority over me, and particularly Monsignor Ryan, who had been uh, Pope John's secretary when he was delegate in Turkey. So there was a, a very close bond between Pope John the 23rd and uh, Monsignor Thomas Ryan, who was an Irishman, act actually. And he uh, was eventually made Bishop of Clonfort in Ireland and died there. Well, that was a very Italian Vatican at that time, so there were a few of you who spoke English. Of course, Jackie Kennedy visited John the 23rd. I don't know if you recall that, although I do know that you did meet her eventually at the Vatican, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did. And uh, I probably was at that audience, but uh, the translation would have been done by one of the senior Monsignors from the uh, section. At the time of uh, the visit of uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, to uh, Pope Paul VI, however, after the assassination of President Kennedy, I was very much in that, that audience. And I must say, I was deeply impressed by the comportment of uh, Mrs. Kennedy at that time. She had gone through this tragedy, and uh, she was uh, certainly a, a ladylike presence in the, uh, at, in the Vatican at that time, one who seemed to be able to rise to the occasion and she was gracious with us all, met each one of us, and uh, of course was very deferential to the Holy Father at the time, Pope Paul Ar VI. Archbishop Cronin, on Divine Mercy Sunday, April 27th, the Church will officially recognize that John the 23rd is in heaven with his canonization. How do you think you're going to feel on that day, having known John the 23rd? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, it's going to be extremely touching because with uh, John the 23rd as a saint in heaven and indeed uh, the one that will be named with him, John Paul II, in both instances I knew them and talked with them and uh, it was John Paul II who named me Archbishop of Hartford and gave me the pallium. Uh, I, you, you know, it makes one realize how close we can be to the saints. 
Uh, growing up as a little boy, we heard of all, I heard of all the saints, and yet they seemed to be off in the distance, ones that had lived in foreign countries and had then ultimately died and gone to heaven and were declared saints by the church. In this instance here, however, uh, to have known uh, two of these uh, saints personally, uh, one, it makes one realize there's hope uh, if one lives a proper life uh, to be a saint in his own right, even though we may not be declared saints. These are indeed saints for today, and that will be a very special day, I know, for you and for all of us. Well, Archbishop Cronin, we appreciate you being with us. Archbishop Daniel Cronin, the uh, Archbishop Emeritus of Hartford, thank you, and we'll be uh, joining you in Rome for that very special day. To all of us on the world over the meantime, with Raymond Arroyo, the Holy Father is once again showing respect for his predecessor. As Alan mentioned earlier, Pope Francis is reminding everyone of Pope Benedict's role in the life of the church, even after his retirement. Francis says the elderly have a wealth of wisdom to offer younger generations. He also says grandparents provide support for families and don't deserve to end up in old folks' homes. A new generation of doctors is hoping to tap into the wisdom of the elderly. A buddy program at Northwestern University is making headway in treating patients with Alzheimer's disease by matching them with soon-to-be doctors. Our Wyatt Spencer has more. Now with your leg. At age 80, retired Chicago physician and educator Dan Winship is getting a bittersweet last chance to teach medicine. Only this time, he's the subject. I have uh, this disease. I have, what is it? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease. Recently diagnosed with the memory disease, Winship has joined a pioneer buddy program at Northwestern University that pairs medical students with Alzheimer's patients in the early stages. Similar programs are now underway at other medical schools. Winship and his buddy, first year med student Jared Worthington, are building a friendship, dining together, visiting museums, chatting about Winship's medical career and Worthington's plans for his own. The program gives young doctors to be an unusual insight into an illness affecting an increasing number of people worldwide. He can teach me about, you know, what it's like to have Alzheimer's, and so I can use that knowledge in the future to sort of inform how I interact with patients and um, hopefully treat them with more compassion and understanding. But it also gives patients a chance to stay socially engaged before their illness eventually robs their minds. We talk together. We talk the same language. He is a very good student. He's learning and learning, learning, and that means everything to me. Organizers hope the program will encourage more medical students to pursue careers related to aging and dementia. It's a specialty few medical students pursue, but one for which the demand is rapidly increasing. Wyatt Spencer, EWTN News Nightly. So a reminder for you, on The World Over with Raymond Arroyo this week, Elaine Bennett will talk about her new book, Daughters in Danger, Helping Our Girls Thrive in Today's Culture. The World Over Live with Raymond Arroyo, Thursday at 8 Eastern, right here on EWTN. Up next, we'll tell you about President Obama's efforts to help minority kids in school and life and how fathers play an important role. And we talk with people about how they'll observe Lent this year. They may give you some ideas. It is good to have you with us on this Ash Wednesday for EWTN News Nightly. Last week, President Obama launched his My Brother's Keeper initiative for young minority men. The idea is for businesses to create programs to keep minority kids in school and out of crime, and that could save their lives. The White House says black and Latino boys are six times as likely as their white peers to be victims of murder. President Obama says fatherlessness is one of the main problems facing minority communities. It's a subject that touches the president personally. I didn't have a dad in the house. And I was angry about it, even though I didn't necessarily realize it at the time. I made bad choices. I got high without always thinking about the harm that it could do. I didn't always take school as seriously as I should have. Tutoring and mentoring initiatives like the Becoming a Man program in Chicago are part of the new project. It was certainly interesting to hear the president speaking so candidly about his past. Well, faithful Christians are marking the beginning of Lent today, giving back to others. Volunteers with the John Carroll Society and Catholic Charities here in Washington are preparing dinner for dozens of homeless men and women. 
We're giving Wyatt Spencer double duty tonight. He's joining us from outside Catholic Charities in downtown D.C. What's going on out there today, Wyatt? Well, Brian, when you talk about Lent, a lot of people think about prayer and penance, but for a lot of Catholics, it's also about charity. So we're just outside of Catholic Charities here on 9th Street in uh, downtown D.C. We're as you mentioned, they've been serving and now preparing meals for homeless men and women here in the D.C. area. Organizations like Catholic Charities D.C. Uh, organize weekly dinners like this to serve hundreds, uh, literally about 200 usually come out week per week. And as you mentioned, uh, members of the John Carroll Society are out here actually volunteering their time this week. So like I said, it is very busy right now and we're lucky enough to be uh, joined actually by the president of Catholic Charities here in D.C., uh, Monsignor John Insler. And, and Monsignor, tell me a little bit about y'all's weekly dinners and, and just give me an overview of everything that's going on here. This began about a year and a half ago, now maybe about a year and a quarter ago. We began in a cold day like today. People say, what about people who don't have to eat? So these people, most of these people are from our shelters, meaning basically they stay in our shelters overnight, but frankly, the government doesn't give us enough money to take care of the kind of meal they deserve. It's $1.80 a night per man or per woman. So we can't give what we want to give at the shelters. So once a week, about 200 men and women come to this line chance to get some really good food prepared by our volunteers, some of our own staff. It's a great chance. They love it because it's a chance to really enjoy a good meal. They come back most for seconds and thirds they can because enough food, until it's all gone, they come back for extras. And obviously the food is very important, uh, Father John, but tell me a little bit about the spiritual part of this because you guys obviously prepare uh, quite a bit of food, but you know, there's a little bit more to it than just that. Yeah, you know, um, for instance tonight, pretty special tonight, Ash Wednesday, I came out and did a prayer and I said, anybody like to have, to have basically have the ashes for the forehead? And then you probably saw a number of people walked up to me hoping to have their, 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 their foreheads blessed with ashes, which is pretty neat. These are mostly, I think, non-Catholics, but they're coming because they want to res respect our faith, but also to receive the gift of what our faith can bring them. So it's pretty special. And we come out because we feel this is our way of being in solidarity with those who are poor. It's a chance for us to say, how can we help? How can we assist you? How can we make sure that you know you're loved? It's not just about this big office here. It's about out front making sure people are served. We do that every single Wednesday all throughout the year. Very good, Father John. Thank you so much for your time. Again, as we're taking a look here, volunteers from the John Carroll Society has been out here as well. Luckily, I'm joined by one of the volunteers here, Sam Dulick. Sam, just tell me a little bit about why you chose to come out here and volunteer. I actually live just a couple blocks down that way, so these folks are my neighbors, so I figured it was a good way to uh, you know, experience some fellowship here in the community. So, so, so walk me through this. What are you doing here? You're serving coffee? What do we got A little here? coffee and hot chocolate, and sometimes for the risk takers, a little half and half, but... Uh, People are really enjoying it. And how long have, have you volunteered here before? Yeah, I volunteered a little bit before. Uh, I've worked with a couple of volunteer events for the Archdiocese, and it's really a fun thing to do after work um, and great, great turnout. Absolutely. Okay, thank, Sam, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. So, again, you can see all the activity that's been going on here, Brian. A very busy afternoon here just outside of Catholic Charities DC, uh, here in D.C. Wyatt, if someone wants to volunteer, they want to join in this effort, what would they need to do? Well, the good news, Brian, is that there's a lot of ways to volunteer, and a lot of that information actually is available online. We're seeing right now, of course, Catholic Charities serving food, but, you know, as we've been mentioning, it's not just food here. There's a lot of different ways that Catholic Charities here in D.C., and, of course, Catholic Charities in locations across the U.S. serve. We talk about prison ministries and a whole lot else. So, luckily, you can either call, you know, local charities in your area, or, of course, like I said, a lot of information is available online, including signups for individuals and groups. Brian? All right, on this Ash Wednesday, Day. Wyatt Spencer joining us along with our director of photography, Paul Fifield. Great job, crew, out there. Remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page if you like. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching. We leave you on this Ash Wednesday evening with some reflections on the holy season of Lent ahead. Good night and God bless you. I find myself really busy. So to really be able to fast maybe from some of those internet and those cell phones and, and um, really go deeper to that spiritual level. You know, it's just for me to identify with some of his suffering as best as I can. Also need to work on uh, the uh, daily rosary. Really feel a solidarity with people who don't have whatever it is I've decided to give up.